You know, I have a memory that has resurfaced recently. And the memory takes me all the way back to I was a young adult, very young adult, at my little country church where I grew up. And um, it was a Sunday night, and um, folks from all ages had gathered toward the front of the church, as we always did on Sunday night, to pray and to seek God. And it wasn't unusual for us to, to pray there on the floor and to kneel for an hour or more. And that was just what we did. That's how we rolled. And we spent a lot of time on the carpet, year after year, Sunday after Sunday. It wasn't unusual for us to do that. I remember praying so long at times that my legs fell asleep. And we would just call it church legs or whatever when you go to stand up and you had to shake your legs to get the blood circulation flowing again. And sometimes we would use that pray, that time to pray for and with one another. Well, one particular Sunday night, I remember, while I was praying, I looked around to see who else was praying nearby and I noticed my dad. And he was on his knees and he was praying. And I remember that the Holy Spirit nudged me, pray for your dad. And I was young and a little inexperienced at the time. And to me, the thought of reaching out and praying for my dad intimidated me. So I didn't. And I went home that night and I remember feeling really convicted in my heart. You know, is it me or is anybody else noticed that sometimes the hardest people to pray for are the ones you love the most? Right? <laughs> so I went home that night. I felt convicted in my heart. I was just probably 19, 20. I regretted not praying for my dad. I regretted not obeying God. And I felt so strongly convicted that I promised God, Lord God, if you ever nudge me to pray for someone again, I promise you I'll be obedient. It makes me wonder, how many petitions I wonder never reach heaven because someone was intimidated? Too many, I suspect. Well, I'll never know what that prayer may have meant to my dad that night. But since that day, all those years ago, I've done my best to keep my promise. No matter who or what the situation. And sometimes I've been in some pretty awkward situations where the Holy Spirit nudged me to pray for someone. I have prayed for family and I have prayed for total strangers. I have prayed for people uh, with very little faith and I've prayed for people of other faiths and I've prayed for people with no faith at all. I've prayed for folks who look up to me and I prayed for folks who were way, way outranking me. I've prayed for the elderly and I've prayed for big, burly, strong guys. And would you like to know how many prayers that I have regretted? Not a single one. Not a single one. James chapter five, verse 16 says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So here's a thought. If the prayer has such great power, then why don't we pray more? Why don't we? Why do we hold back? I suppose that there are many reasons. I'm just gonna, let's just share. Let's just talk about this for a second, church. Why, why could it be that we don't pray more often? Well, there's lots of things I've come up with. Are we too busy? Yes. But we are way too busy not to pray. <laughs> After all, with everything you've got on your plate, with everything you've got to do, ma'am, you've got so much to do, how could you possibly on earth do it with just your own strength? You're too busy not to pray. You're too busy not to engage in the power of heaven in what you're doing. <laughs> I, recently, a couple weeks ago, Mar Mario wasn't feeling well, and so he was staying home and I was heading out to, uh, to work in... Um, I was rushing by and gathering up my things and rushing by and, and uh, the Holy Spirit said, pray for Mario. And I said, I'm busy. <laughs> and, and so what I did instead was I shouted to Mario who was in the office at the computer, hey, have a good day, Mario. <laughs> and I ran 
And then I ran by, and then the Holy Spirit said, <clears throat> I asked you to pray for Mario. I said, okay. So I ran into the office, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, hope you feel better, Mario. And I ran, and I ran into my car, and I got in my car, and I started up the engine, and the Holy Spirit said, <clears throat> I asked you to pray for Mario. And see, the Lord is still working on me to keep that promise. So I walked back into the house, walked into the office and put my hand on his shoulder. I said, God wants me to pray for you and I'm being disobedient. <laughs> I guess I was just too busy or whatever. Or maybe like I said, sometimes it's harder to pray for the people you love the most. So I prayed for Mario and went about my day. You know what, we're not too busy to pray. Sometimes we have to be still and know that he is God. But some of the other reasons we don't pray, well, how about this, is prayer too humbling? But is that not the point? <laughs> years ago, almost 30 years ago, one of those awkward situations that the Lord asked me to pray for someone was someone from a different faith than I was, a different walk, a different tradition. And... She was a friend of mine and she was in my home and she came over. We were both expecting babies at the same time. And she had just come from a doctor's appointment where they told her that her baby in her womb was probably gonna be Down syndrome or have multiple birth defects. And she was heartbroken. Well, guess what the Holy Spirit said? Pray for her. And it was awkward. I was young, I was intimidated, I didn't know what to say. What if God doesn't answer? And all these things that you think in your mind too. But I did, I said, well, this may be uncomfortable for us, but would you mind if I prayed for you? And she said, please. So I prayed a simple prayer, I put my hand on her shoulder and I prayed that the Lord would heal her baby and we said amen. The next time she went into the doctors, they took another scan and they took more tests and they realized that this baby was gonna be perfectly normal. But God, right? Today, oh yes, but God. Today, 28 years later, that young baby is the head of the OR department in Mercy Hospital in Portland, Maine. <laughs> yeah, to God be the glory. In Matthew chapter six, Jesus taught us how to pray. And you know what? Some of you might be relieved to know that he's not looking for fancy, wordy, religious prayers at all. He's looking for simple, humble, sincere, honest prayers. God already knows what we're gonna ask him for before we even ask it so we can actually let the pressure off. He's not expecting us to write an essay. He's not expecting us to sound very, very fancy or whatever. He's just saying, would you just pray a simple, humble, sincere prayer and I'm gonna hear that and your Father in heaven is gonna answer. Why don't we pray more often? Perhaps are we too distracted? Definitely which is why the Bible gives us so many examples of people in the Bible, Jesus even, who woke up early in the morning while it was still dark to go find a quiet place, to get alone with God before the busy, before the rush, before the distractions, before the family gets up, before you have to rush off to work. There's something so significant and even pivotal, pivotal in that moment that we spend and give to God at the beginning of our day. I have heard you say, come away with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. Why don't we pray more often? Are we too discouraged? Sometimes. Sometimes we get discouraged like Adam was talking about earlier, because we haven't seen the results to what we've been asking for yet. I feel that I'm here to remind somebody today to stir up hope, stir up faith, keep praying, keep believing, keep waiting, keep seeking God, his perfect will, his perfect plan, and his perfect timing. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has Great power. Somebody say power. There's power when the church prays. 
Power within us, power among us, and power working through us. There's a story in the Bible about what I want to bring our attention to this morning. It's found in the book of Acts. But before I get right to the story of the power that takes place when the church prays, I have to give you the backstory first. And hopefully this won't take three weeks. But in Acts chapter 1, there's just a little bit of a, I'm going to recap a little bit of the chapters leading up. In Acts chapter 1, we see a glimpse of Jesus after his death and resurrection. He spent 40 days with his disciples. And then the time came for him to ascend back to heaven. And he gathered them around and gave them this instruction. Wait for the promise. And an amazing thing happened. They actually did. They gathered, 120 of them gathered in a room and they waited and they prayed and they waited and they prayed. And then something even more amazing happens. The power of the Holy Spirit fell on them from heaven and they received power and boldness to go out of that room and preach the good news about Jesus in many different languages. Why? Because thousands of people were visiting town that day from all sorts of other nations. And God gave them the ability to to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in languages that everybody around could hear and understand. It was amazing. And 120 people were empowered. The crowds came running. Peter preached his first message and something amazing happened. 3,000 people were added to the church that day. 3,000 people believed in Jesus Christ and the church was born. And in one day, 120 believers grew to 3,000. And guess what? They had baptism service. 3,000 people. All 3,000 of them were baptized in one day. That's a big service. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the day when we're baptizing hundreds? Can you imagine it? 3,000 people getting baptized. Leading us into Acts chapter 3. Well, Peter and John, filled with the Holy Spirit, were on their way to a prayer meeting one day when something amazing happened. They came across a crippled man who had been crippled since birth, and he was sitting outside the temple begging for money. And he looked at Peter and John, and he asked them for money, and Peter and John said, we don't have any money, but we will give you what we do have. And they took him by the hand, and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, Rise up and walk. In Acts chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and he helped him up. Notice that he didn't get a hand out that day. He got a hand up that day. And by the right hand, he helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And he jumped up stood on his feet and began to walk. And then walking and leaping and praising in God, he went into the temple with them. The crowds came running. And that's when Peter preached his second sermon, teaching the people, guys, look, all this power, it's not me. It's not me. It's the power of Jesus Christ flowing through me. And Peter gave all glory to God. He gave all attention to Jesus Christ. This is the power, the power of resurrection. Don't ever forget, church, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you today. Peter said, it's not me. It's not me. Don't even put your eyes on me. Put your eyes on Jesus today. And many people in that crowd heard the good news and believed in Jesus and something amazing happened. The church grew by 2,000 more. The Bible said 2,000 men, so you know that typically means you might double that or triple that when you count the women and the children. In Acts chapter four, the church was just getting started. Here we go, Acts chapter four, verse one. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests. Some would say, uh-oh. <laughs> the captain of the temple guard, some of the Sadducees, these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching that people through Jesus, there is a resurrection of the dead. 
and they arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. Dun, dun, dun. Hmm. Well, the next morning, Peter and John had to stand before all the rulers, the elders, the high priests, the lions, the tigers, and the bears. <laughs> Verse seven, they brought in to the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done all this? And that's when Peter basically preached his third sermon. In Acts chapter four, verse eight, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, someone say filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we bringing question today because we've done a good deed for healing a crippled man? Do you wanna know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? When the church prays, people see something on you that maybe others haven't seen in a while. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. They conferred among themselves. What are we gonna do with these guys? There's a riot outside. People are shouting. People are believing in this Jesus that we crucified. What are we gonna do? If we punish them, there'll be a riot. The people will revolt. What will we do? Verse 19. Verse 18. So they called the apostles back in command, commanded them to never again speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. When the church prays, there is a power that unleashes in our lives. There is a power when we get filled with the Holy Spirit that we can't hold back our testimony. We can't hold back speaking about the goodness of God. We can't hold back. No matter world, what the world is telling us, there's gonna come a day when the world might tell us, stop talking about Jesus. And heaven forbid we lose that power and that freedom of speech as the church of Jesus Christ. But guys, we're gonna need more power in that day. We're gonna need more power in that season. We're gonna need the power of the Holy Spirit to give us courage and to give us boldness to keep talking and keep telling the goodness of God and the power of Jesus Christ. Verse 21. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone out there was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. There's power when the church prays. Power to become witnesses, Power to boldly pray for people, power to boldly expect miracles, power to boldly preach about the good news of Jesus. And as they began to spread the message, hope, salvation, healing, deliverance, resurrection in the name of Jesus, they experienced both miracles and opposition, both excitement and adversity. And that's when the church gathered to pray and something amazing happened. They didn't pray for their problems to go away. They didn't pray for their adversity to go away. They didn't pray to get beamed up out of that land into heaven and just so they could just avoid it all. The church prayed for boldness. The church prayed for more courage to preach about Jesus. And here's part of that prayer in Acts chapter four, verse 29, as the worship team comes back. They prayed, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Simple prayer. 
And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with boldness. Can't hold the church down, guys. And the church prays. And when the church taps into the power, their power source, and the church prays that the Holy Spirit would fill them with courage. You can't hold them back. No weapon formed against us will prosper. No devil in hell can keep us silent. No demon or tactic of the enemy will keep you from sharing your testimony. Verse 32. All the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that they owned what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. Did you see it? The church prayed. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. All the believers were empowered to share their testimony. The church was unified. They were given powerful testimonies and a great blessing was on them all. I sure hope that as you enter in times of prayer in the days to come, that you'll experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And when you sincerely set aside that time and allow the Holy Spirit time to work, you're gonna find yourself filled with courage. You're gonna find yourself less intimidated to share you're going to find yourself more unified with the people in your world. In the name of Jesus. And while the church prays, there's power. Let's stand. When the church prays, there's power within us. When the church prays, there's power among us. And when the church prays, there's power working through us. Power. Anybody want power? Anybody need power? We all need the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God's calling us to do. Every single one of us. Oh, dear Lord, don't try to do it on your own. <laughs> Heaven forbid any of us try to do what we're called to do in our own strength. We need power, right? Second Chronicles chapter 7 says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, will turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their land. Oh, there's power when the church prays. But guys, it's about obedience. It's about humility. It's about repentance. It's about heaven hearing heaven forgiving, and heaven restoring. It's about power, power within us, among us, and working through us.